I don't know. But I only know what my heart feels. And my heart feels like... My heart still feels like the best... You know, the best is yet to come. Seventy nine T twenty four fifty eight Learning Learning Corp Little Red Riding Hood take one. Fellas, morning. How's your Saturday? Oh, I hope we're gonna have some fun. I have a good one for you today. We're gonna have a good one. So first off, uh rule zero is gonna be on Glenn Lawrence's channel. I do believe we are going to milk that stupid conservative cake nonsense for what it's worth. If you guys don't know what that's about. Um, conservative Christians have decided that they're red pilled now. And the instant that happened, a bunch of ex feminists who couldn't make it jiggling their jumblies on there have decided that, well, just do it for conservatives. So they put on a turtleneck, bake a cake. Everybody loses their damn minds. Whatever. Is there ever a bad? There's been a few bad red mornings. That erudite one wasn't exactly the best. <laughs> I've never had I've never had a podcast before where somebody looks at me and like gets mad. Like I'm not even it's not even that I tuned it off. I got mad. <laughs> it's like fair, fair. Oh, there's not a lot of Twitter drama. We'll talk about it there because here it's going to be. I always try to keep this one as uh, actionable advice. You know that. And I thought this is a great opportunity to get off of of the hype train. Everybody's worried about. Oh, what's the next new thing? What's the next new thing? And I'm like, dude, focus on the basics. Like I am convinced. After after seeing, and I granted it's online, after seeing the online people dealing with their nonsense and having their real life nonsense kind of seep into it, that if they manage to read through Glover and they get covert contracts and nice guy validation seeking behavior, if you can kill those two things, 99, 95%, 95%. Of all the problems people are having in love and life and work and branding would just go away overnight. And it's, it really is the case of uh, the 10,000 rule. And that's where the introduction is. Because you guys have heard of this, right? I'm sure you have. Because every Jocko Wilnick wannabe self-help guru slash East Indian guy in Bangalore with a stoic statue of Marcus Aurelius on any social media platform and the AI voice telling you to believe in yourself is all said. It's just 10,000 hours to, to master anything. And you're like, wow, 10,000 hours. And then you pull up your calculator, which I'm doing now because I'm not doing math in my head because I got to sound entertaining and I can't do that while my mouth is open. I'm swallowing flies and doing math. 10,000 hours divided by 24. 416 days. That's full days. You multiply that by three because at the most you can spend eight hours on something. That's 1,250 days divided by 365. 3.4 years. You mean to tell me that if I spend every waking working hour for 3.4 years or 1.4 years that I can master anything I want? Yes, he is. And you know why? And you know why they say that? They say that because you're never going to do that. And then once you don't do it, you're like, well, I just didn't put in the 10,000 hours. If I put in the 10,000 hours, I would be an expert, but I'm not. And that's okay. Because I didn't want to anyway. And this is where you make up those goofy excuses. I don't want to be that obsessive guy. I don't need this. Smoking weed and playing Xbox is so much funnier. Couch, but that would include doing something and not just grandstanding. It's worse than grandstanding. It's a... Uh, it's absolving people of their sins. And this is why modern marketing, especially the self-help marketing, is no different than Catholic confession. You know, how many days, spectacles, testicles, wallet and watch, how many days has it been since your last confession? Sorry, Your Honor. I've uh I, I've been I've been beta male for two two different situations. I know fapped but failed three times, and I yelled at three whammon online. Well, then just give me three alpha males and move on. Yes, thank you, Alex. I haven't brought this sweater out in a while. Last I had it, last I had it, uh, Flawed was on the on the podcast. And it was my Christmas Pink Panther sweater. I'm like, I don't know, for some reason, just Pink Panther seemed like the one. Having said that, with the Christmas workouts, the shoulders are getting a little tight and the chest is getting a little tight, so we'll have to get there. <laughs> Ryan Stone, don't shave and don't wear pink. Don't tell me what to do, sir. 
I'm like everybody's daughter. You can't tell me what to do. You're not my real father, I don't think. Sorry, Mom. You had to know. Anyways, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, the 10,000-hour the thing. So it turns out it's not 10,000 hours. It's like 200 hours. And there's a bunch of people that do kind of what I do, just in the same way that my kind of gimmick on Twitter, for example, is just to be anti-bullshit. Which is why you'll see me rant like, what the hell is he talking about? When I'm talking about some goofy fruit fly study, there's a lot of bullshit because you know what? It doesn't even matter why. Just go with me on that one. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to ramble. This is not a, this is not a Rollo Tomasi podcast. I'm not going to spend four hours getting to the point. Love him to death. He does have a way with words that I don't think I'll ever have. Uh, do you recommend Influence by Robert? No, I've never read it, so I don't think I need it. Anyways, so uh, they looked into it, and that 10,000-hour rule, it turns out, it's more like the 200-hour rule. And the difference was, it was between people who were, oh, and I hate putting it this way. This is an illustrative example. Don't focus on the numbers. Focus on the story we're trying to tell here. So you go from zero to 100. Zero being, I've never done it. I don't know how to do it. I don't know anything about it. 100 being you are the Olympic champion in that thing, top in the world. You are the Bobby Fisher. You are the Usain Bolt. You are the Wayne Gretzky. You are the Pat Stedman of getting arrested by being a dumbass. The absolute best and top and pinnacle of the human endeavor in whatever it is you're talking about. To go to about 80, 80%, you need 200 hours. And to get from 80%, to 100% is that 10,000 hours. Now, obviously, not everybody can be the best. Only one guy can be the best. And, you know, you swap the titles out if you want to. And a lot of times there's a genetic factor that, like, yes, if you're the hardest working man on earth and somebody who's got a genetically superior gift over you is equally working hard, he's going he's gonna to outdo you. It's just the way it is. But in the same way, that you can have a great sex life just because you don't look like a Chad because nobody wants to be in that top 20%. You'll be just fine just slipping in under the radar. 200 hours. Can you believe that? 200 hours. What is that? That's like a month. A month of like eight hour days. That is eight months, less than a year of just one hour a day. That's like nothing. But nobody says that. You know why? Do you know why no self-help asshole says that? Because it's attainable. It's attainable and it's doable. It doesn't matter. It's editing, making a podcast. 200 hours. I've done, these are two hours an episode. I would argue the first 100 episodes were trash. Absolute trash. We're on, I don't even know what episode we're on right now. Like my thumbnails are on 157, but I know we also deleted like another 160 of them from before, back when Carl was on there. So probably 300, but yeah. Same thing. Making videos and you want to learn how to edit your first 100 hours of videos 200 hours of videos will probably suck but then it's good same thing with a uh, pickup you want to go talk to girls you want to go sleep with girls you want to go swipe on hinge you're probably gonna notice like your first 20 30 approaches are pretty bad and then they get and then it starts to click and i'm not going to sit here and speculate as to the reasons part of it is just the confidence not to not to flub your lines, which is a crazy thing. That's and this is something I remember from when I was in uh, in university. I had to take a a drama uh, thing as part of my art art training, fine arts. And the one thing they told you was if you ever flub your line when you're doing a theater production, don't do what everybody else does. And everybody else will you know flub your line and go oh, shit. and they kind of like do that under their breath and then fix the line. Don't do that because all you're doing is drawing attention to you flub the line. If you just move forward as if the line was fine, nobody will notice. I've since, I've since learned to call this subway theater, the, the flubbing the line thing, subway theater, because I noticed this when I was in Le Metro in uh, Montreal. Every time, like I'm sitting here waiting for my train and somebody else will be waiting for their train. And then they, let's say they run up and miss the train. You don't just, like, the doors close, they go on. The guy can't just be like, just stop running, take a second. They always have to stop running, look at the train going off, look at their watch, give one of these. It's almost like some weird signal, so, like, I just need everybody to know why I'm running towards a train that stopped. It's like everybody knows you missed the train, dude. Nobody cares. 
And then I started looking for it and everybody does it. So everybody flubs their line and just goes. Ch so part of, I would argue part of the 200 rule is learning to stop telegraphing your failure to other people. Absolutely. Another part of it, just getting better at something. Like you obviously know the bell curve where you, you suck at something and then you get better at something, but your confidence is like way out of whack because you don't know the things you don't know yet. And then you reach that valley of despair where you know what you don't know in something and you know your ability to execute and your um, vision are far apart. But then you get that last bit of the climb, the last hundred hours, you get that climb into a confident competence. I can't remember who did that one where they talk about the quadrants of uh, knowledge. There's like a competence and an incompetence, a confident and an unconfident. It's like confident competence. Confident, incompetence, incompetent, confidence. You know the one. I'm not going to. Yeah, and, and you see it and you see it replicated everywhere. Like I remember that Bruce Lee quote. When I first started the art, uh, a punch was a punch and a kick was a kick. Now that I'm good at the art, a punch is no longer a punch. A kick is no longer a kick. Now that I've mastered the art, a punch is just a punch and a kick is just a kick. <laughs> Kyle in chat. Twitter is mostly BS and shit posting. It absolutely is, as it should be, dude. As it should be. Do you really want to start getting all of your intellectual stimulation, 180 characters at a time? I don't. Like that is the that is the Bill Nye the science guy of science communication for this shit. It's like, nah, bro. If you if you if you can't explain to me this insanely complex thing in a tweet, then I don't want to hear it. It's like I don't think that's how it works, man. Yeah, debating on Twitter. Jesus Christ. So now that I've gotten all of this out of the way about the, the covert contracts, about the validation seeking, about the complete ease that somebody can not master something, but at least have competence in something, that's what's what leads into the topic. Let me just do my... The topic is men raised as defective women. I say this all the time. I say it all the time. I love saying it. And I'll let you in on a little flub on it. So when I say that, it's usually because you'll notice a man is acting like a woman. Whatever. I'll give you some examples later. But the difference is because he's not a woman, he doesn't, it doesn't work right. Like when a guy starts playing victim, everybody looks, he's like, ugh. What a fucking weirdo. If a girl does it, like, oh, I feel so much for her. Maybe if I, maybe if I'm nice to her, she'll fuck me. Like, you know what I mean? It just doesn't hit right. So. Yeah, men raised as defective women. Now, the only thing I don't know, the way I, the way I describe it in, in my work is that we have been kind of gaslit or trained. Borrowing par partially from Robert Glover, Dr. Glover, where he talks about the industrial revolution's effects on the family family unit. Guys go to work at the factory all day instead of being at home, so they're removed from their uh, raising their children. Or divorce, where men are also removed from their raising of their children. And so men are raised by women, raised with women's sensibilities, and then adopt female you know, strategies, getting through the day, that kind of thing. Now, that's a theory. It's not true. I mean, maybe it's true, It's maybe it's not, but it doesn't matter. I always... It's, and it's, it's another, another saying I use, where... If I tell you the moon is made out of cheese and, and it gets you to the gym three times a day, I'm like, well, fuck it. The moon's made out of cheese as far as the red pill is concerned. It absolutely is true. It doesn't matter what's true. It matters what's useful. If it's true, so much the better. So you may be thinking to yourself, which you not, but I'm going to use this as a, as a rhetorical device. You may be thinking to yourself, hey, that post hoc justification and lying to yourself thing, isn't that what chicks do? And isn't that a weird strategy when you're talking about men being raised as defective women? And I would argue, shut up. Yes, of course it is. Half the red pill, three quarters of the red pill, almost all of the red pill stuff that take, requires like a little bit of a leap of faith from you is, is uh, female strategies adopted to male sensibilities. And it's, it's like the secret that they don't ever tell you. They never tell you that. Like what? Yeah, female strategies. Adopted to male sensibilities. Dread, for example, which is from the best selling book that's out on Amazon right now. Audiobook coming out at the end of the month. Dependent. Fucking <laughs> hate that thing. 
Dread was a, was it started with guys who saw the female strategy, you know, end of uh, end of Franco's practical and David Clare's practical female psychology betaization process. That's the the roadmap, the way a relationship tends to form over time. Shit test the man, get his uh, get him to open up to you, put him to work. I always get these last two wrong: self determination and evolutionary selfishness. Yeah. So the idea of self determined or evolutionary selfishness, sorry, goes first, is once you're in the part of the relationship, you've gotten everything you need from the guy. It's the seven year itch. The kids turn five. They're able to go to elementary school. You got some time off. Dads are no longer essential. They're more good to have. A girl will instinctively try to distance herself emotionally from her man because women are hypergamous. And hypergamy is what enables monogamy. The idea is. Guys love variety. Guys can love their wife and then love 18 women on side of that, but not in the same way. But women can love one man at a time. That's it. That's it. I either love you or it's somebody else. And so when they're in love with you, they don't see other men as attractive. And so this is kind of an evolutionary uh, uh, subconscious thing where all of a sudden nothing's ever good enough. A lot of the nagging starts. And it doesn't hurt that that men make themselves less attractive over time in marriages, especially nowadays. So it just makes the job easier. So that way they can get that, that war bride dynamic going on where they kind of, you know, I'm not really into him. He was always abusive and all that. Like, look at the destiny, the cucksmurfs divorce. That's exactly what the kind of stuff we're talking about here. And then you get to the evolutionary selfishness, which is just, you know, I found a new man. It's going to be great. Get the divorce, accuse him of abuse, get the cash and prizes. You know the deal. So when you have all that stuff together, Guys notice that the girl would check out of the marriage like, you know, six months to a year beforehand. She'd start getting into shape. She'd start losing weight. She'd start making new friends, start dressing differently. And they're like, huh. And that's how a woman leaves a man and has him totally clueless to it. Well, let's take that, you know, monkey monkey branch. I think that's what the kids call it. Monkey branching. What's a monkey branch? Well, when monkeys swing from tree to tree, which I don't know if they do anymore, but whatever. They always hold on to the one until they grab the next one. And that's the, the guy's like, that's what women do. And that's how the MRAs, and that's how the MGTOWs, and that's how the black pill guys, and that's how all the not red-pilled manosphere gurus talk about it. And I always hate saying gurus, so derid. it's so kitsch at this point. So why don't we just do that? You're in a sexless marriage. You're being taken for granted. Why not do the exact same thing that women are doing? It's like, well, I don't want to leave my wife. I don't want to teach myself to fall out of love with my wife. I love my wife. But... I just want her to be less shitty. So, all right, let's do this. Branch swing, but with, a, with an olive branch. And that's kind of how it went. <laughs> You're looking like an American hitman. <laughs> American hitman wear pink, do they? It's the uniform. And so that's how Dread kind of came about. And a lot of these concepts, like we can go down the line, but I don't have a prepared list of all the different uh, male sexual strategies from the red pill that are adopted from female ones. But yeah, for the most part, that's where it is. So that's, that's, sounds completely contradictory to, to avoiding being, being, acting like a defective women, right? Like, well, yeah, but the red pill is full of contradictions. There's things that outright contradict each other. There's things that don't make sense. That's why autists don't do very well here. They really don't. Cause they're like, wait a minute on this side, you said branch swinging is bad, but on this side, you're teaching guys how to branch swing. So I don't understand. You're like, shut up. Shut up and go back to Autism Corner. Can you argue about Star Wars and leave the rest of us alone? Leave the rest of us alone to go have sex with our wives and somebody else's wife. God damn it. God damn it. Yeah, it's contradictory. Yeah, everything's conditional. Yeah, it's not categorical. It's not thou shalt not do thoughtery or whatever shit like that. Because it's not a religion. We're not a we're not a sitting here like, oh, Saint Roger Tomarso of the Tomato Clan. Have how to beef with St. Andrew of the Tate clan. And just like, fuck off. It's a bunch of guys that wanted to get laid. And then as they got laid, they started adapting to other male sexual strategies. And then realizing, hey, how about not being a piece of shit? <laughs> positive masculinity. What is a positive male identity? Well, it's like, and then we get into like, oh, the narcissism. Well, that's kind of psychologically bad. So how do we do this without turning into like a mental midget? And everything like that. So yeah, there's a ton of contradictory stuff here. There's a ton of things that don't make sense. And this is how I know. This is how I know. 
whenever you see like a red pilled hater online or uh, on YouTube or these red pill guys are bad and they'll get the, the thumbnail of that one photo of Rolo where he like just got out of bed and his hair was growing and he looks all disheveled or the one of Andrew Tate with his fucking soy face. And I'm like, ah, okay, this is how I know he has no idea what he's talking about. Because if you really wanted to, if you really wanted to, all you had to do was read maybe half of the stuff on the sidebar and you would start to see all these contradictions and you could easily come at it with like a, well, they said this here and they said the exact opposite here and the opposite here. And like right there would be a great critique. And I think I've only ever heard it once and I can't even remember who it was from. It might've been the create, it might, Kyle might've been your co-host there. Uh, I think so. Don't quote me on this one. Robert, $4.69 super chat. Cheers, couch, bringing back the cooking vids, bake cakes. <laughs> Dude, there's so many timing inside jokes that I'm missing out on. Yeah, it's everything's dependent on finishing the book. Like I said, the audiobook right now is uh there's 4500 units. I don't know what the number represents, but 4500 in dread. And I am at 3200 with the recording. So, I can get if I if I got a whole day, nobody does any construction, uh, the girl's not home. The dogs aren't acting up. I can get about a thousand to 1200 units done a day. Then once all that's done, I'll master it. I'll do the QA. I'll do the, uh, the, the MP3 conversion stuff and then upload it on there. And then it's however long their QA process takes, which is weird because fuck files took 30 days and that's how much time they required to approve it. But then frame took like a week. So somewhere in between a week and a month, after I'm finishing the process, the, the mastering and QA usually take about a week each. So two weeks plus three more days for the recording, then however long their process takes and it should be done. So don't worry, we're getting there. And then once that's done, that's it. That's it. I got no more content to have to worry about. There's the weekly sub stacks, which you should totally subscribe to, but it's going to be so much fun. I got, I got video game things I want to record. I got cooking videos. I got two vlogs I'm ready for, like a vlog and a red pill coffee. I'm having so, I got the script sitting there. I got brand new Kramer equipment to film. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, things y'all learn in Asia. All women are like that, even with the white guy handicap. Don't buy the buckets. Honestly, being a white guy in Asia is kind of like being a, a blonde girl with big tits in India. It, it helps, but it doesn't change anything. Anyways, where was I going with this one before we got distracted by that wonderful, lovely super chat? If you guys want to distract me, I'll, con I'll podcast. I won't complain. I'll just have to make a better effort to keep on point. Uh, let's let's change the pace. Let's make fun of somebody. Who do we not like? Uh, I've already been... Oh. Yeah. I've talked to Ryan Stone once. I'm pretty sure the whole conversation, I pushed him like pretty hard. What was hard, Ariel? <laughs> The therapist will essentially give them SSRIs, which I think you know, like you know the, the sexual effects that SSRIs have in the body, right? Uh, some, like yeah. there's tons of like MAOs and like tricyclics that you're talking about like the, the type of SSRIs that used to be given to pedophiles. We don't give those to men. We don't give those to men. We don't give those to men. But he's not as informed as like I think oh. people like to be. Yeah. We don't give those to men. Yes, you do, you son of a bitch. It's the most prescribed thing. How do you, off topic, how the hell do you claim that you're some biochemist, psych major, mental health expert and not know shit about SSRIs? <laughs> what the fuck? So there's this last, last psychiatrist article, which is absolutely hilarious. It's, uh, I think, what's it called? The fetishization of certification as, as, as something or other. And they bring it up that they... What people do is it's all about offshoring risk. So... He was bringing up a hypothetical argument where, so he's like, the way you describe narcissism makes no sense. It doesn't sound like what they say in the DSM. What's up with that? And he goes, well, you're asking, you're asking what the authority is that I got it from. It's like, no, no, no. Just how do you know what you know? No, that's what you're asking. Even if it's not what you're asking, because if I don't provide you an authority, then my words and my statements have to be judged on their own merit and they raise and fall by how useful or how accurate they are. But if I provide, well, I got it from this source or this source then that offloads the responsibility of knowing what the fuck I'm talking about to somebody else. And for psychology, they had a, a brand new exam. It's like every four years for shrinks, you had to take this, this upgraded shrink to find out the newest things in shrinkology, which was hilarious. And he goes, hey, I read through it. 400 questions, not one 
about Xanax, which at the time was the most prescribed mental health medication. Nothing on SSRIs, nothing on none of that. How are you supposed to tell me that you're getting the cutting edge, most current psychological thing when you don't even discuss the most prescribed medication in the world? And, he, and then he notices like, that's why, because now if you fuck up, if you fuck up, it's not my fault. That's what the policy said. I'm just following orders. That's what the that's what the experts said. The experts have to change it. Then the experts are like, well, it's just the way the policy was written. This was before my time, but we'll fix it. and We'll get right back to it. Meanwhile, your wife has left you. You're on SSRIs. Your dick doesn't work. And you're like, well, thank you very much, sir. At least that's nobody's fault. Thank God for that. Well, Mr. Peterson, at least we can get your daughter a good branding here while we detoxify you from the diazepams or whatever they called marzipans. <laughs> Which is, I guess, I guess that does make her a mental health expert because she doesn't know what she's talking about. Anyways, uh, defective. Yeah, speaking of defective women, yeah, men raised as defective women, and I don't think there's a better manosphere red pilled example of that than the men's rights advocates. Men's rights advocates, aren't you guys on the same team? Aren't you followed by quite a few? Don't you follow a bunch of MRAs? Yes, I like them as people. But the movement itself is just trash, and it always will be. It's it's design. It's it can't go any other way. And there is a lesson for you from your own venues or your own interest, in the same way that I'm taking interest in it from a red pill perspective, right? What the fuck are you talking about? I'm getting to that. Bear with me here. I gotta make this entertaining. Do you realize a guy right now is doing a set of squats and he's doing it to the cadence cadence of my voice? Up, down, up, finish. Take a rest. Tweet three times. We're good. Repeat. Oh, what I'm talking about this. So the men's rights advocates, they, and I, I, my history is not going to be great. So I know in the early to mid seventies, the birth control pill came out in what, 67, something like that, 1970. And then what a lot of guys noticed right away is that women were crushing it. Dude, I can go to the office now. I don't have to get knocked up by that dude. Uh, my hormones are in check. So I'm acting like more of a man. And then the guys are like, yay, free love and sex. And everybody's like, not you, only that guy. And then they get mad about it. And so you get uh, a bunch of feminists to get really pissed off because, hey, we were promised after the after the war, the gender war was over, we were going to get the spoils. We got screwed out of it. And that's where you get like your Esther Villars, uh, Camelia Pagelia or whatever her name is. You know, the ones, the very, I used to be a feminist, but now I'm on the side of men. And they'll either get it because they didn't get the uh, the milk and honey that they wanted from, you know, a subjugated male population, or they had sons of their own and their son got screwed over and they're like, well, this is wrong now because now it's affecting me. It's like, fuck you. But, uh, and yeah, I know S. Lars on the sidebar. And then the one I'm referencing here and is Herb Goldberg's The Hazards of Being Male. And you read in there, it's it was a bit in the 70s. And if you read it today, you're like, holy shit, this stuff all kind of still applies. Which makes me laugh because it's like, to read it, to read Esther Villar's thing, it all paints men as the victim. And that's my, your first example of men being raised as defective women. Men painting themselves as the victim, hoisting themselves on their own petard in order to get sympathy. Do you know why that doesn't work? Because that's what women do. And do you know why that works? Because men want to fuck women because men have an instinct to protect women. It's innate. It's part of us. It's part of our DNA. It's a feature, not a bug. So when a woman cries victim, our we at least have at least pushes the needle on sympathetic and you know helping out and being manipulated, all that stuff. When a guy does it, it just builds a disgust reaction. And I'm pretty. I bet you anything. There's like a Jordan Peterson lecture out there somewhere where he's like the male disgust factor in the top five. And I'm like, yeah, that's the one. That's the fucking one. There, now you had an expert say it. Now I don't have to rely on you just trusting me on it. You can, I could point to him. And if he got it wrong, well, it's like he was just following orders. So that's like validation seeking right there. That, that male victimization. That's, that's a result of men being raised as defective women. And it happens all the time. I still see it. Dude, look, as much as you may like or you may not like that uh, that goofy Twitter drama stuff. And I don't blame you. If it wasn't part of my job, I would hate it too. At this point, I'm just like, whatever. As long as I get a chance to show tits and pretend it's like, you know, and glean off of that, it's worth it. Build your subs once t one person at a time. And that's why if you go, like here, if you go on it right now, I remember seeing this, 
I've made the revelation before, but I made like an effort, I think it was two days ago or yesterday, is you read through it and everybody's got something against them. This people, this person is doing me wrong. This one's doing me dirty. These people are against you. If it's not, if it's not the Jewish or the Israel or the Zionists, it's the, it's the, um, crime, urban, African-American population, or for the libertarians, it's the statists. Or if it's the women, it's for the men. If it's the incel guys, it's all oh, the women are against us. And if it's conservatives, they, those fucking red pill dudes or, or those fucking feminists. And if the feminists, it's like it's those red pill dudes and those Christian conservatives and everybody's at each other's throats, but nobody hates anybody. It's always, you're always being oppressed by somebody, which makes me laugh because most of the stuff you're seeing, at least like you know, conservative or male stuff is always based on the women are keeping you down, but you're not a victim. It's like, yeah, of course. When, when I'm contradictory, it's because things are, <laughs> it's things are uh, conditionally true depending on the situation. When you're contradictory, it's because you're not paying attention and you have zero self-awareness. We are not the same. And once you see it, now that I've explained it to you, you guys can't unsee it. You can't unsee it. You're going to hate it. You're like, oh my God. So I'm just scrolling around right now. This one's against me. This one's against me. Misha's posting an old bodybuilder chick's boobs online. Fair enough. All men are like this. All women are like this. Things are this. Bad is this. It's amazing. And I, I know it's not just Twitter. If you go on YouTube, it's the same thing. It's just this 30 minutes of pretentious talk first. Unless you're watching cooking videos, in which case nobody's ever against you in a cooking video. It's always this, they never told you how to make a crepe properly. This is the secret knowledge you've been missing out on. You're like, holy crap, that crepe is moderately competent. I want four of them. I'm not even shitting on it. I love the crepe videos. I refuse to do croissants from scratch. So I'm like, dude, have you seen the workload on that? Fuck that. Fuck that. So it's one great example of men being raised as defective women. Well, it wasn't C-suite, dude. Yeah, no. I, I wasn't even I wasn't even director level. That takes that takes about a decade to get there, and I I cut out much quicker than that. But honestly, for guys, I don't like that route anyway. It seems more geared towards women, like the ability to be able to eat shit with a smile. As guys, you're far better off going the contractor route. Pop in, pop out, like Benji or the littlest hobo. Anyways, where am I going with this one? Uh, victim, victim. I'm not like that anymore. Vlad wants to join the Minecraft server. Oh, dude, I can't wait to do that. Okay, I got to remember to reach out to him today because we I'm going to have him come join the Minosphere SMP. It's going to be awesome. Rusty Fuel, $4.99 Super Chat. What ski resort do you recommend in Canada? What resort has the best snow and the best food? Well, the food, I don't know because I haven't been to one in a while. But if you're going to come to the ski resorts, come to the West Coast. Don't even worry like, oh, there's Mount Tremblant. Shut up. If you go to BC... That's like the hill that they put the kids on when they're practicing while the adults go to the one. You go with like Black Diamond and shit like that. Um, and the beauty of it is, it doesn't even matter which one you go to. Yeah, everybody talks about Whistler, but Whistler's extremely overpriced. The infrastructure to get out there is horrible, but you can easily go to just go to any town over 100,000 people in British Columbia, and they will have a kick ass ski hill. You got, uh, I remember there was Sun Peaks. In the North Thompson, there was, there's Whistler, Jasper, Banff. Basically, you can't go wrong. Yeah, everybody says Whistler, but Whistler's like, uh, you never go wrong by suggesting IBM. What's the one in Kelowna? Hold on a second. Let me look this up. Big White? That might be all right. Uh, and then Jasper. Or Banff. I think Banff is the one in Jasper, yeah. Yeah, so I would say, honestly, I would probably say Banff. But that's mostly because when I was growing up in British Columbia, they had, there was always two temporary jobs. There was tree planter, and there was working on the ski hill. And the one in Banff, like, the, there was, like, an encampment where everybody lived, a little, it was almost like barrack living. And everybody was fucking everybody. It was a lot of fun. It's right on the cusp between BC and Alberta. So yeah, I think you'd like it. It's definitely the fun party town kind of vibe. Like if you ever watched any 80s movies like Ski Patrol or Ski School. Yeah, they're very creative with the naming. 
I think Banff will give you your closest experience of that. Whistler is more like, I want to hang out with rappers and I want to spend too much money for eggs. And then the small ones are just like, I like going skiing. It's kind of like the equivalent of golf courses. You can go onto one that's part of the tour, super hover price. And it's very you know prestigious. You can go to the one that's uh, like in Hawaii or uh, that's known for you know being difficult or whatever. Or you can just go to San Diego and hit up the one there that's uh, part of the, the military. Yeah, the military has their own golf course in San Diego, which is an awesome golf course. But it's essentially just walk in, say you're in E3, pay your 15 bucks, and you just go to golf because it's fun. And that's what I would equate the uh, the average BC City's ski hill to. And then the very difficult one, the fun one is the Banff, and then Whiskers, the pretentious one. As far as food, you can't really go wrong. Canada has so much diversity and inclusion that all of our food is really great. Like you might get stabbed, part of some ongoing blood feud, but the food will be great. Uh, when is Rolo going to reveal the reason he's been picking on the conservatives? Cake bacon video, pretty obvious. The conservatives want 1950 again. Could she dress like that? Dude, it, why don't you ask us? Ask us during rule zero. I'm more than happy to answer it there. Here, and I get it. We're ranting about ski hills and shit, but there's like a... Could recommend ski places in Austria. Well, yeah, like so, Bish, uh, the European equivalent of the Rockies is like the Alps. You know how everybody's like, oh, they're skiing everywhere. But the, the Swiss Alps, the German Alps, the Austrian Alps are like the place. The Rockies are like that. Actually, I think the Rockies are better, if I'm not mistaken. But either way, it's up to you. Now, where are we going with this? Oh, yeah, defective women. So men raised as defective women. That's the other thing. In the 50s and 60s, and you can see it in your cigarette ads, they used to have to market female products based on fear. Fear was the hugest one. Fear and aspirations. You're not pretty. No man's going to want you. You're going to die alone and lonely. Therefore, buy my moisturizer. And you're like, wow, women are gullible. As the guy's like, I'm not wearing that. That's for the gays. So what kind of moisturizer do we use? Brill cream on your hair. And the grease from the engine you worked on on your face. And that was good enough. I shave every day. What more exfoliation do you want? I blame Subaru Foresters. Nowadays, it, guys, are, guys are very soft. Soft, effeminate. Is that guy in the pink sweater calling me soft and effeminate? Yes, I am, sir. I'm wearing it because I can. You wear it because you have to. We're not the same. So marketing has kind of caught on to that. That there's a giant glaring insecurity among men and chalk it up to whatever you want in the second world war it's pretty hard to have the germans shooting at you for two years and then come home and not <laughs> and not be a little tougher i think i can handle somebody being mean to me on twitter it's better that time i had to i lost my buddy to that grenade <laughs> it's like are you making fun of world war ii survivors no i'm making fun of you for not being one even the Vietnam, like everybody's like, the oh, boomers are weesh. But to be fair, there was a good chunk of boomers who went through Vietnam. And granted, they're some of the most animated conspiracy theorists out there. But you can't argue that, like, they've seen some shit. After six months in the jungle, you think they're going to come home? It's like, damn, I really wish you'd be nicer to me. No. I'm going to get you on them punji sticks. Ski hills raised like defective girls. Exactly. Hey, coach. Nice to, nice to see you live. All right, coach. <laughs> Fucking coach. Don't ever tell the internet you don't like something. Better have a damn good... It's not a fake sweater. It's a real sweater. It's a real sweater. It's made of fabric and everything. Where was I going with this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. The weesh thing. So, yeah, maybe it's that there's not enough hardship out there. And to be fair... It's not that we require the hardship. It just, it had a side benefit. Yeah, you might die. Yeah, you might be mutilated. Yeah, you might uh, get shell shock or PTSD and all that stuff. But on the side effect, if you survive through all of that, you're going to be hard as fuck. But those people weren't doing it because they wanted to do it. They were doing it because they had to do it. And there was a use for it. This is one of my little arguments that I make. Whether it's true or not doesn't really matter. But it's a useful way to, to frame the situation is pre-industrial revolution, a man's strong arm and a strong back were absolutely valuable because other people liked it. People who owned the farm could get you to work on the farm and they could make money off of it. The queen could send you to war against the French and then she got to secure new land in Normandy. Therefore, you were useful. <laughs> Andrew Tate's Romanian passport. Is that uh, Pat Stedman's Polish passport's new, uh, new account? Nice. Uh, so you get those 
but now with the invention of of, of or oil, the industrial revolution and that stuff, it's not really needed anymore. And so now that it's not needed, nobody's using it. So guys don't get to feel useful. And so we have this general malaise. And that's why you see a lot of people ranting about, we need a rite of passage for masculinity and shit. Like, like remember what I was talking earlier about that certification? Yeah, it's, it's the certification. I'm just following orders. That's what that rite of passage stuff is. That's guys sitting there going, man, I want a, a man card, a literal man card given to me by an authority of masculine figures sitting on top of the mountain telling me, yes, you're a man now, sir. It's like, bro, if you need somebody to tell you how great of a man you are, hire a prostitute for the girlfriend experience. They will do it better than anybody. Oh, you're a big man. That's the biggest one I've ever seen. Oh, the 10 inchers? No, just, that's just a rumor. Those don't actually exist. It just turns out there's fisheye lenses makes them look bigger. Wow, here's your $200. It's on the nightstand. Uh, try not to steal anything when you leave, sir. No, no, no guarantees. No guarantees. Yeah, you must join a tough mutter. Yeah, and I, I mean, I know Paul's done one and a bunch of my buddies have done one. They're fun. They are fun. But it's manufactured hardship. This is that shit. I've been saying this like at the very, like when I first started doing this, I was talking about those uh, performative and this is the other men raised as effective women. Performative bullshit. You know, ninjas used to shower in cold rivers. The Vikings used to dive into ice lakes. And they're tough men, so I'm going to be a tough man by doing what they do. It's like, dude, the Germans in World War II wore sweaters. I'm going to wear a sweater, and I'm going to be a German too. It's like, that's not how it works. It's literally the idea, the same idea that when you get that nine-year-old girl who wears her mom's wedding dress and she pretends she's at a wedding, like all the parts are there, but something's just off about it, you know? The same thing here. Guy sitting there taking an ice bath, and I'm not talking about the cold water immersion that uh, Dr. Seeger talks about. I'm talking about the, like, the ice bath, the cold showers, the getting up at four in the morning. It's just self-flagellation. I'm a man because I'm carrying this cross down the road so the so the Romans can haul me on the thing nailing ourselves to the cross and that's something that performative uh victimhood thing that's such a chick thing to do like is anybody here is anybody here uh, of Jewish descent you'll probably know this you know the whole meme about like the Jewish mother with the woe is me stuff like oh you're killing me Gliven. I I don't know how to do the the thing. I just, I'm West Coaster. We didn't. I didn't meet a Jewish person until I was like 30. So I don't know. <laughs> oh, 32. <laughs> I'm still at the point where I'm novelty and I'm asking about the holidays and stuff like that. What's this one for? What war happened here? What the hell's a Canaanite? What are Hittites? They're like, oh Jesus. <laughs> how does that hat stay on? Turns out there's a little clip underneath, so it clips to your hair, so that way it doesn't move. I at those time I was just Ben Shapiro had like really good balance and he never shook his head too much. No, there's a clip. So yeah, you get guys doing that, that performative nonsense. Like I'm a man because I did all of the things on the checklist. Who made you that checklist? Some asshole. You go to that asshole. Where'd you get it? Oh, I stole it from this asshole. And then you find out it's just a bunch of assholes that stole from each other and one autist somewhere who thought it'd be funny. Hey, you know, what'd be funny. Let's jump in a lake covered in ice. You know, on, on one of them fail blog videos and then some Christian conservatives like, dude, that sounds great. That'll that'll teach you, dad, <laughs> leaving me. Uh, the Jewish mother phenomenon is a big part of why Jews have weird sexual hang ups. Yeah, like I said, this is all new to me. I don't know any of this stuff. I'm one of the few people who apparently doesn't have a strong opinion on the on the on the chosen ones on here. So I'm like, eh. But I just found it interesting. Apparently, Indian mothers, same thing. Very, very oppressive and um, shit like that. So they raise guys to be like this. And that's where you get this crap. And it's it's like, dude, when I was in the military, we had, uh, I don't know what we have now, but at the time we had frigates, destroyers, tankers, and two submarines, one of which was not on fire and sailing. <laughs> we had to take, they call them pusser showers. The idea is there's like limited fresh water on board. So when you get into the shower, you turn on the shower, rinse yourself off, turn off the shower, soap yourself up, lather, la la, turn the shower back on, rinse yourself. Obviously, you guys have had a normal shower before. Do you know how when you first turn it on, the hot water doesn't start right away? It takes like a minute. Now imagine a ship that doesn't have hot water. Imagine that all the time. And it was just, and it's just because that's how you shower. Because if you did more, your coxswain was going to hand your ass to you. 
because you're wasting the water on the ship and then you have to pull into port. It like has some operational efficiencies to it. If you're on a submarine, even worse, you have to use wet naps. Wipe yourself off with wet naps, put them in a bag, take them with you when you go to shore and throw them out. That's why they don't like showering. It's like, dude, you know how much work involves the shower? Like, no, nah, we'll shower when we get home. So that was why you were taking cold showers. You took them because you had to. It's because ninjas and shit didn't have hot water heaters in the river where they had to hide from the Shogun. So you get some guy who doesn't know his head from his ass. He looks at that and he's like, oh, well, if I do all this, all the easy stuff around there, then I can be just like them. It's like, no, if you want to be a samurai or a Viking, you better get raping and pillaging. If you want to be a samurai, you better find a Shogun and start killing farms people. You can't go back to that shit. And you sure as hell can't a la carte it. Like, do you even train in the katana, bro? Or do you just pose for pictures with your fedora? Come on. Yeah, basic training showers were an eye open for eye opener for time management. Exactly. And that's where most guys who have military experience, especially with the cold shower or the... Because I know in... Uh, well, I guess if you were in the Gulf, the showers were warm. But that's only because nothing was cold in the Gulf. Where you had that bag. You put it over the thing. And then you just, it basically just drains water on you. And that's your shower. Yeah. But who else is performative? Oh, chicks are so performative. How many how many girls have you seen online or off? Probably in your own real life. If, but if you're antisocial, you've probably seen online where a girl makes up this fantastic story where she's the victim and she's a good woman. And like that, that uh, the stupid drama about the cake thing is exactly that. All right. So I got to get into this now uh, a little bit. The gist of it was there was this big titted blonde Christian conservative chick who was baking a cake, but you know how, how Twitter uh, frames things, usually from like the middle of the frame? So all you see is just two two giant jugs staring at you talking about cake baking. And it's like a there's like 15 of these videos and none of the girls know how to cook. I'm like, dude, if I cut, like one was cutting an onion, but her fingers are under the knife and you're like, what the fuck? These guys have no idea what they're doing. And then you realize, oh, it's a fantasy for these guys who want that uh, that virgin wife. Wow, this is what girls are like? Yeah, that's what girls can be like, sir. Help yourself. Go for it. And I don't know what it was about this one. From what somebody told me, I didn't really follow it too much. I just like to meme, and I just take a stab at I think that's about this, and I always get it right because people are pretty one-dimensional. But uh, I guess she had a, a contact email somewhere on something. And then somebody looked at it, and it was the equivalent of like... Do you want a girl in a bikini to jump out of a cake or girls on trampolines? Or I don't know if it was OnlyFans stuff or just like generic Miller Lite, have a girl jump up and down at your kid's birthday party for you thing, but something like that. And there was a huge backlash that half the conservatives wanted to have female allies and I wanted to fuck her. So they're defending her, her honor. And then the other half of guys are like, get this thought out of my real conservatism. And then all the girls are just fighting amongst each other. And that's the point that matters here. Oh, so she was an ex-porn star. Fair enough. I don't know who anybody is. I don't even know her name. I know it's Della Luca or something like that. Only because when she blocked me, I, I saved a screenshot of that. Because I was like, this seems like it'd be fun to fuck with. So. And then it was. <laughs> this is the part where I'm talking about like the the, the being raised as defective women thing. So the one girl, and I think that's Andrew's wife. which you remember from the rule zero thing on there. She was like, you're a whore. Stop being a whore. And then the other girl clapped back with, yeah, well, you have like three kids from two different dads. If I'm a whore, then what does that make you? And then this other girl's like, well, at least I'm not as much of a whore as either of you because my sweater is slightly higher on the thing. And they were building up all of these surface reasons why I'm not a thought, you're a thought because my sweater is in pink. And like, well, pink is the color of nipples. Mine's in green. Everyone's good. Well, green's the color of thoughtery. And there was this escalation and it's, it got all the way to uh, Sydney Watson of of heartfelt fuck you fame. The last time a red pilled red pilled guy started interviewing traditional conservative mainstream social media, told her to go fuck herself. I'm like, well, I guess that's our that's our chance. <laughs> we blew it. And she was talking about all oh, these girls sitting here being hoes. Meanwhile, I'm just here playing Elden Ring. She's wearing a hoodie, but it's like. The one thing you didn't see was Elden Ring. You're like, where the fuck's Elden Ring? She's just sitting there making a goofy face and it's framed right in. And I just laughed. I'm like, oh boy. And you notice this? The only thing that didn't really matter was all this Christian conservatism. The only two things that didn't matter were Christianity 
and conservatism. It was all about who was a whore and who was not a whore and who's an incel that's shitting on the whores and who's the one who's simping. Just two groups of people fighting over this stuff. And then me in the middle just throwing throwing feces like a chimpanzee at everybody. I thought it was hilarious. Then they then they doxed Rolo's daughter, sort of. Like, they started posting photos of her online. And everybody's like, well, it's not doxing because, of, like, yeah, shut up. I'm not playing that stupid word game with you. I'm not a... I had to deal with, like, five years of troons after after Trump. I know, I know how the word games work. Shut up. Where am I going with this one? Oh, yeah, the men being raised as effective women. And that's when you get this. And when you realize that the big difference between men and women when it comes to social hierarchies. Wait, there's an actual point to this? Oh, yes, there's a point to this. And it's a good point, too. First, I got to hit XRunner 55's $2 super chat. War will end when women are in control. Oh, it will turn into the fifth generate fourth generation warfare nothing but character attacks assassinations plausible deniability say what you will about men in their first and second generation war but at least you know where you stand so where am i going with this one? Oh yeah 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 so yeah the one thing that's missing is the thing and the difference between men and women when it comes to social hierarchies is men uh it's a concept that i'm taking i'm borrowing now or at least expanding on from the Red Pill Rooms blog written by Ian Ironwood. He talks about men have the sandbox and women have the swing set. And the sandbox is the male social matrix. That's because like in playgrounds, guys would play in a sandbox, you know, build sandcastles, shit like that. I don't know if kids do now. I'm sure there's some sandbox app for your tablet. Give that to your kid. You can raise them for you. So guys tend to surround a thing, uh, an activity, a squash club, a bowling league, hunting club military it's always it's always about a group of people that collaborate together in order to achieve a certain aim so guys will join the thing of which there's always like an ent there's a version of an entry entrance exam for all of it for the military it's you got to pass basic training you got to pass your fitness tests uh in a company you have to get hired by the thing you got to go through the interview every masculine social hierarchy always has some kind of entrance exam and the, the way he summarized it was initial fitness testing followed by wholehearted acceptance. In other words, once you're in, you're in. It could be hard as hell to get in. In the military, there's like subgroups on that. Like if you wanted to be in the Canadian military and you wanted to join clearance diver, there was a clearance diver prelim. You had to pass your medical exams. You had to get through two weeks of hell. And it was hell, man. I, I, I'd like, I have four friends that tried for it. Two got in, two didn't. And it was just brutal. And a lot of guys got through the prelims, but then they found some crazy, like, oh, there's a little hole in your heart or something like that, which there's a chance you might explode. So we're not putting a million dollars of training into you. Sorry. Sorry you beat your ass for like the last month wearing dish soap underneath you so your wetsuit didn't rip your skin off. But eh, you'll get them next time, Tiger. You're like, fuck. Wholehearted acceptance. And that's the other thing. So once you're in a group, you're in. If you start screwing around and doing stuff there, there will be internal mechanisms to sort it out. Uh, if you act more in the group's interest, you'll do higher on the hierarchy. If you do worse in the group's interest, you do worse in the hierarchy. At least that's the way it works in like a pure male environment. Everything is kind of like, there's a little bit of chicken there, a little bit of status and posturing. So it, there's no real example. It's like real communism's never been tried. We're talking about the ideal here. Sandbox. Women, on the other hand, is the swing set. And that was, I think he came up with the term swing set because he was talking about how women use plausible deniability. It's a really good article. I wish I could remember what it was called. But um, the way it worked is that women and men interact like women are on swings. And every woman is sitting on her swing and she wants a man to push. She wants that man to push her. But she can't just say I want you to push me because the other girls will attack her for being, oh, she just wants to get a man to push her. What a slut, whatever. So she kind of has to make it seem like it's not my fault. He's the one pushing me. And so sometimes they'll wear shorter skirts to get a guy to walk over because if he pushes it just enough, he can see a little bit of the whatever in her underwear. But he can't. she can't be too obvious about it because then the other girls will be like, well, shame her for that. And so the female social matrix, he used the term swing set to describe it, where it's kind of, you have to be ruthless character assassinations, make yourself look better at the expense of other people. And the trick is to make it look like you're not doing it. Like I didn't want to be top of the fuck pile. It got thrust upon me. 
and they have to act like you're all even though you're on top you're acting like the victim and if this sounds familiar it should because uh at least in america kind of in canada too but mostly america you notice how the the conservatives and the liberals are always treating it like they're the they're the victim they're the rebel alliance and the other group is the empire like trump's been out of office for four years and a lot of like the progressive liberal americans are still bitching like dude trump is hanging over us like the uh the first order and i'm ray and we're gonna get crushed it's like bro you won you won you put him in jail almost it's like relax no he's against us then you talk to the conservatives the damn joe biden took my trump now i don't know what to do it's like oh man it's crazy how every four years it changes but you guys are always like how can every not everybody can be the the rebel alliance eventually somebody has to be the empire i'm just saying but that's how it works. You have to top from the bottom. So when you see men being raised as defective women, that's when you start to see this shit. You start to see, uh, and military guys will know this one. You know, I guess, I don't know, is America considered a peacetime? I guess it's peacetime now. They're bringing a lot of like DEI investments in there. But have you ever seen that careerist officer thing? Do you guys have that in the States? For here, it was for Mars officers. I don't know what they call them now, but they were the... They were the ones that could eventually captain a ship, right? They were the, I think, infantry officers would be the equivalent for the Army. Air Force officers, probably pilots. Where, they, they, you always know, like, they'll eat their own. They'll fuck you over for their career. It's all about the career, even at the expense of, uh, of, of effectiveness. So it's always about their self-aggrandizement. It's like that one article, I love this one, where to become a general in the American military is a 30-year career in ass-kissing and ass kissing and not pissing off anybody which was such an unmilitary thing to say canada same thing it was at the point where guys kind of had to have a very adversarial role with their with their officers because you had to be like i don't know if i can trust this guy not to fuck me over you don't say the wrong jokes you don't say this treat him like shit keep him in the dark and tell him nothing and the guys that didn't usually ended up getting their pp slap for it and then you kind of learn and that's where you see this defective women thing sleeping. Same thing. I, I, I don't like it. I'm not part of it, but I do enjoy from afar watching like a, like a, like a Jane Goodall thing, watching the Christian conservative right, whatever the fuck that means talking. Cause that's all it is now. It's everybody posturing to be the coolest person on stupid mountain, <laughs> coolest person on retard Island. You know, Cernovich is talking shit about him and Tucker's talking shit about him and Elon's talking shit about him and everybody's sitting here fighting over who gets to be the, the first loser in second place. They don't actually care about a conservative political movement. They don't care about actually, you know, achieving a win or something like that. I think what's the Red Hawk always tells me this stuff. They like to lose with nobility. In other words, they want they just want to win their little social circle battle. They don't actually want to win a thing. That's men being raised as defective women on the same thing. You know that on the other side where they talk about the left eating itself and they always go after each other and those purity spirals and shit like that. Same thing. It's all been invaded and men are now, it's not at the point now where just inviting women in has created these female catfighting situations. It's that men are raised to act like defective women. So now women aren't even leading the charge. There's some examples where they have their own little cat fights, but for the most part, it's guys doing this. It's absolutely ridiculous to watch too. And it makes you wonder, it's like, why do you even want to join an organization that's like that? I wouldn't. I, I still laugh where there's like red pill guys in 2024 of the year of our Lord, 2024. This is like Tyrell Corporation future, flying taxis, robot sex bot wives. And we're still sitting here saying feminism's out to get you. If only we could beat feminism. It's like, bro, have you seen the people on your side? We need to get men back to the church, bro. The church has abandoned you. I, 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 there may be some good ones out there, but everybody I've talked to in the States, everybody up here is essentially secular. It's at the fact now that any like evangelical religious person is either holed away in some time capsule of a community, like the Amish, or there's probably some Bible Belt places, or, or they're performatively online making way too much noise. It's kind of like uh, the Troons. There's like 17 of them in the States or a million total or something like that of 300 million, whatever number it is, half a million. It's, a, it's like a rounding error, but they're all online and they're all talking to each other. So it looks like this giant enclave. It's like a third of the country. It's like, not really. 
just a third of the country that's online and talking constantly. Most people now are secular. Even the religious people are secular. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to bring up that example. Anyways, Dark Knight Dev, $10 super chat. That's two heartfelt fuck yous. And I think it's totally deserving to a man like you. Speaking of Ian Ironwood, trad life is actually 50-50. While single income families are a new thing, look up the housework issue article by Ironwood. It's not feminism. It's the dishwasher to blame. I know. I've been saying that a long time. And he was one of the sources I got it from. From him, from Whisper, and a few other guys. It's technological change changes things. Environmental change. Our, our gumption and our movements and that don't change anything. Our ideology is the song playing on the radio. And he's right. The dishwasher changed it. Because once housework stopped becoming full-time drudgery, it sent a lot of free time off. And that's when, that's why in the 50s, this is the one thing they don't talk about is the Milltown Martini, if you've never heard of this, like Quaaludes and Prozac and a lot of antidepressive medications came out and chicks were fucking bored as a stay-at-home wife because the dishwasher, the oven was a turn-on, the dishwasher was easy, the iron doesn't need to be put in a fire and they're like, well, I finished everything in like two hours. Now I got eight hours with nothing to do except for gab with the other girls in the neighborhood. I'm bored. And so what do they do? They drink and they take pills. And they're like, well, why don't you just divorce your husband? And they're like, sounds good. At least it's something new. Yeah, you can have the house still. But yeah, and it's one of those things I wish more people would understand. It's one of the few things that I wish I wouldn't actually mind being more persuasive on and not just be like, it's the information, take it or leave it. It's just understanding how your environment affects your life. Like mental health crisis, I think is a falsity. I, I, I know I'm going Tom Cruise on this one, but when people are depressed, when people are anxious, it's not because there's a chemical imbalance in their head. It's because their environment is making them that way. So yeah, fix your environment. It'll fix your mental health. Do you ever wonder why it's always neats who have depression? It's always guys whose wife's left them at depression. It's almost like external events are what caused this thing. Well, just take some pills. That'll fix it. Will it though? Will pills bring back your bitch ex-wife? Probably not. Will pills affect the, that you have a, a degree in gendered studies and no job and live with three <laughs> child diddlers? Like no. Uh, Sam Whiskey, $4.99 super chat. Dudes can extract their defective women cred by patting their kayak through the Red Sea. Oh, paddling the kayak. The Red Sea. Is that a reference to what I think it is? Are we talking like Red Wings? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I won't go there. But hey, if you want to go there, go there. It's also why women incessantly complain about how bored they are. Only boring people are bored. Oh, yeah. Only boring people are bored. A lot of guys are doing that too now. But that, And that's the thing with this whole like, well, men do it too. It's not really an argument anymore. It's like, yeah, men are turning into bitches as well. So yeah, everybody's a bitch right now. The difference is half the bitches got a nice rack and can bake a cake half ass and the other half of bitches are simping for her. So I was like, I don't know what to tell you. Let's move on. Uh, what the hey? You want to tell me why the majority of people that voted yes, I can be submissive are men? Just want to talk a little bit about why I love women. And the majority that said no are women? I would love y'all to ponder that for a fucking second. I love how they always make sure, by and large, they shower. The feminine energy that that girls put out, it's just, it's magnetic. You think I can be submissive? You fuck I adore it. I feel bad, but not bad enough to stop. You know? Do you know that feeling? Like, he's in jail right now for, like, six years because he went to the Capitol and claimed to do all this stuff. And he was a prick for years. And I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to have my fun. But now he's in jail. Now his life is literally like his kids are being raised without him. His wife's probably moving on. I don't know. Maybe they'll get back together when he gets back. I don't know. And it's like, dude, like, stop. He's already dead. Like, yeah, well, fuck it. I'm not better than this. I'm not better than this. Are you better than this? Because I'm not better than this. Is straight Christian five pound super chat. Heartfelt fuck you, sir. <laughs> What, Ryan? Not six foot? Plays Tekken for pennies? Fuck that guy. Oh yeah, if you guys don't know why I always like draw attention to the $5 increments in Super Chats, it's because $5 Super Chat is the red pill career ender. Somebody sent Andrew Tate when he was on Rish Cooper's channel a $5 Super Chat saying I called bullshit on his 
one of his stupid campaigns and he went off for like 45 minutes about how much of a dick I was. His wife's a four or his wife's a three and he plays Tekken for pennies. He's not six foot. He's not a real man. Most important guy in the world. I didn't know about most of it. I just, somebody sent me like a five minute clip. I'm like, dude, I can edit that for an ad. And then Kyle went on his show and they're like, yeah, look, and there's like 17 more of these. I'm like, holy shit. I could have been, I could have made a real life movie of why I'm an ass and <laughs> showing the podcast. So now, and then the Jack Murphy, Sydney Watson had read a $5 super chat of asking about the cuck article. And that's when he started yelling at her with the heartfelt fuck you. And so now the joke is $5 super chat is how you end a career. So that's why I always tell you guys four ninety nine or five dollar one. So when somebody sends me five pounds, it's because they want me to cuss them out. Heartfelt, fuck you. Anyways, I've already lost two good friends when I tried to talk about the stuff Ryan talks about. It's very negative, apparently. Instructions unclear. Oh, dude, don't red pill your friends. Don't. You can't teach this stuff. Like I, my approach to this, even from my perspective, is I don't want to proselytize. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. The few times I've actually debased myself and done a debate with somebody online i'm like look i am not here to convince you of anything i'm here to have clear instructions as to what's going on you can accept it you can not accept it that's fine but i'm gonna make sure you're at least accurate about hating it but yeah your friends in real life no 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 never do because you never most people when they're having problems and they want your advice they want you to tell them that what they're doing is good they want the red pill certificate of you can go ahead and do whatever you want to do and learn things the hard way approval. That's that authority thing. Remember that right in the beginning of the episode where, well, that's what the, that's what the policy says. That's what the authority says. That's what they want. They want you to give them permission to do what they're already going to do. So it's not their fault if something goes wrong. Well, you told me it was okay. I didn't tell you shit. <laughs> but as soon as you start saying, yeah, we'll read Rollo Tomasi's whole book. First off, and, and don't do that either. If you're that guy that's like, you know, I'm having some problems with women. And then you hand them like my th books and Rolo's like, here's seven books. Read it. You'll know everything. Stop that shit. Communists do that shit. If you haven't read this book that you don't know real communism, it's like, bro, I can't articulate anything I've learned. So just read it. Don't, don't. But yeah, don't red pill. I don't ever talk about this shit with my friends. Maybe if there's a very specific thing. They'll bring up like one of my buddy's divorces and it's like, oh yeah, how do you not know that? Like at work, I see it all the time where it's like, there's this, I always say it's, there's this shrink I know, or is this guy I watch, he talks about it. And that's always, it's very vague, fungible. Yeah. It's cause you know, he got bored and he started spending too much money and they're like, yeah, probably. And you just move on from that. Like we don't, you don't have to talk about it. To be fair, you living a good life is the only persuasion you ever need to do. Dude, I've been struggling with women for years. Uh, is straight Christian and you just keep swimming in Poon. What the hell are you, what the hell am I doing wrong? It's like, do you really want to know? Yeah. Well, start here. And then you give him the smallest piece of advice ever. Something very small and bite-sized. Cause if he doesn't do that, that's your way of testing. If you're wasting your time talking to him, like that's why lifting, do you even lift bro? That's why it's always the first thing because, and there's a mids watch coming up where Jack and I argue about his bespoke versions versus my very boilerplate shit. He goes like, look, if some guy's like, yeah, my wife's a bitch and I want to join the red pill or do that thing. And they're like, oh, strong list five by five. Why? Is, is that going to fix my marriage? No. But if you can actually stick to a workout program of working out three days a week, then that shows me that if I tell you something, I'm not wasting my fucking time talking to you. That's really it. If you can stick to that, you can stick to anything. But yeah. So yeah. And I, I mean, that's... That's not a very good thing anyway. Like red pill is about positive male identity and male sexual strategy. Proselytizing your friends and losing your friendship. I don't think that's a very solid answer. Like all of your friends don't have to be ideological identical to you. Again, that's some shit communists do. I don't want to be a communist. Do you? I don't. I'm perfectly fine with a lot of friends having diametrically opposed beliefs to me or thinking something is horrible or something is wrong or something is bad. And you can do that and still get along with them. Absolutely. Like my buddy, uh, my best buddy always tells this to me. He's like, you know, we don't have to talk about this. And that's kind of his way of saying like, ah, eh, we're at the envelope. Let's not push. And my family, the same way. We're, we're all like five type A personalities. If we all started speaking our mind and trying to get on the same page, we just yell at each other constantly. So we just, we've all understood that in order to be a family, we just don't push the envelope past the comfort zone, except for, for Christmas on Christmas, find the red button of every member of your family. We take turns, just shitting on each other, get it all out of your system. It's like the Festivus tree. Hey, there he is. There's Kyle. 
five dollar one cent super chat now that's a true fan the one penny is for freedom uh kind of funny watching rad femme austrian painter about reacher being diced what the hell are you talking about like i i know who you're talking like i know the rad femme reference that's that one crazy chick who lost control custody of her kids who loves talking shit online but Oh, was that about that stupid uh, guy who tweeted about Jack Reacher? Like he and his girlfriend were watching Jack Reacher and she started swooning over him and he felt really insecure about it. That's funny. The instructions unclear, penis caught in ceiling fan. Yeah, the worst thing is using jargon. Oh, God, yeah. The one thing you'll notice, like uh, I did, I've done a pretty good job. I probably could do slightly better, but sometimes it's just impossible not to. If you ever read through, I don't know, who here's read through Frame and and Dread? Probably a few of you at least. I'm hoping at least one. Judging by the sales, I'm guaranteeing at least most of you have. I avoid jargon like the plague. And if I do use jargon, I always define the term beforehand. I talk about the mental models, like she's not yours, it's just your turn, shit like that. Yeah, basketball topic and mundane topics. You don't have to have an in-depth conversation with guys. If they want to, sure. If they don't, don't fight. Don't force it. You don't want to sell them Amway products. Even the even the bluest of blue pill beta males can still be a really good friend. So don't worry about that. Um, I see your thing, Dev. Give me a sec here. Where was I going with this one? Uh, one of the best. Yeah, and she said, dude looks gross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had to block her. It's not for her sake. It's not for my sake. It's for her sake. It's like, dude, I would shit on her so much. And she would probably love the abuse. She looks like that kind of girl that loves being abused to play the victim. I'm like, yeah, this ain't going to be healthy. Although it'd be entertaining for you guys to watch me shit on her constantly. Ever since that one Twitter space we were at where she was, uh, you know, you're offensive. You know, because I was like, yeah, take a girl on a coffee date. Don't take her out to dinner. I'm like, I'm not going to waste your time if you don't like me. And I'm not going to waste my time if I don't like you. And I'm not going to spend $100 to feed you just to find out we're not vibing. Fuck that. She's like, you're such a jerk. And I'm like, well, at least I have custody of my kids. Uh, Oh, yeah. And I rate that's the uh, straight. That's kind of what the reason I'm getting there. But I'll get to there in a sec. Dev's asking about buttermilk pancakes. Need your help making the pancakes for myself. How much flour and buttermilk? You don't need a lot of buttermilk. You can actually use yogurt in a pinch as well. The whole point of the buttermilk in that is because there is uh, a bacteria in it from when you're coagulating the milk into buttermilk because it's like they take out the cream and for cheese or whatever. Or from butter, sorry, not cheese, hence buttermilk. So it's because the lactic acid buildup of the bacteria create like a, a tangier flavor. So you can get the same effect from yogurt. You don't need a lot. I think it's like maybe a third. But, I mean, the recipes online are all pretty standard. But for me, it's usually like a tablespoon or two. It doesn't really matter. Uh, what am I... What were we talking about? Oh, the jargon. Yeah, Rolo uses jargon in his books, but finds it and mentions that it will come up again. Yeah, and that's standard for writing. Like, whenever you're doing any technical writing, if you are going to use a term, you always define it first. But for the most part, I, I, I avoid it 90% of the time. It's always, I'll just describe the thing without using the jargon. Because I find jargon has utility to a point like jargon is good for brevity if we're all you know red pill guys and we're talking about red pill things if i start talking about a walt you guys know what i'm talking about because then i don't have to bring up all women are like that because of this this and this and this and it, it it's like 10 minutes to explain the term and everybody's like i get it just say a walt but there becomes a point where the jargon obfuscates what you're talking about and that's when you start getting normies talking about it and that's where like the best reason I can give you for why jargon is not helpful is the difference between a guy who watches this stream and a guy who watches like a Pearl or a Fresh and Fit stream. They will throw all the jargon at you, all the right terms, but they're talking about something completely different. Like I remember my Patreon. There was this one guy talking about doing uh, what they call it. Oh, yeah, he's, he was joining about his wife or whatever. So I want to learn to to frame the oak. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, he knew what frame was. He knew what oak was, but he didn't know what to do with them. It's like, yeah, I want to be the alpha oak. Alpha oak to frame the wife. And they're like, what? Shut up. And that's when I realized most of these guys in here, like, well, Myron's helping young... No, he's not helping young men. He's confusing them. Because they walk in confused as fuck. And to be fair, I, I don't have the patience to, like, unlearn somebody's bullshit to teach them a whole bunch of new stuff. I would rather just 
relentlessly mock them until they go and do some actual research and learn on their own. Cause it's like, I don't care. I, I don't have the patience for this. I'm not going to put more effort into helping a guy than he puts into helping himself. You know, Christianity unplugged $1.99 super chat. First rule of fight club. Yes. A lot of people forget that fight club was actually meant to be like a philosophical treaty for men. They really do. It's like, Oh, it's just about a bunch of guys shaving their heads and f- doing shit. And it's like, no, it was meant to be the male version of like the sisterhood of, of traveling pants or something like that. That and dead poet society. So yeah, all of these things like the scene in the tub where it's like, maybe a woman isn't the answer we need. It's the idea that finding a girlfriend is not going to solve all your problems. The idea of your parents not being helpful influences on you, all of this stuff. I mean, like everything there has like an underlying subtext to show all the places that men have been failed and the way they're working around it. And he just hides it behind this satirical over the top thim- thump, or simps versus thugs masculinity. It's, it's, it's a really good work. And if you haven't read the book, read the book. Like the movie is good and the ending is better, but the book has like so much more. Uh, I know they talked, there was like a part where he talks more about how he jizzes in the clam chowder. Like there was like a section for that or uh, what was it? Marla or no, a girl having a wedding and they fucked with all of her perfumes and she has like a fucking meltdown whole bunch of cool shit like that. turns out the fat wasn't actually from a liposuction clinic. It's Marla's mother kept giving her fat from her liposuctions and left it in the fridge. And then Tyler would just take it and make a uh, soap with it. And it was the funniest part of the book. I remember where they're having like this fight. Where the fuck's my mom's fat? I made soap out of it. You son of a bitch. And I was like, dude, that's such like a, a Midwestern married couple thing to do. <laughs> Anyways, it's worth the read. Once I finish the, the book, Part of my new content is going to be like reading red pill books or uh, Manosphere books or just guy books and giving like reviews of them. And that's going to be on the list. Finding a girlfriend only creates more problems. I mean, it just creates different problems. It sorts out the problem of uh, the other half of my bed is cold. It warm that right up. This whole time I thought I was a Sigma alpha male, but my doctor diagnosed me with autism. <laughs> yeah. This movie's Fight Club. Like I said, everybody talks about it like a meme now, but if you actually give it a good read and a good watch, it's worth. It's well worth. I uh, The whole part of this section was what do you do about all this stuff that I just told you about? And we're already like, you know, 15 minutes in. I haven't mentioned anything I want to do. And as always, the answer is both simple, hard to implement, but easy at the same time. It's one of those things that until it clicks, it looks impossibly hard. But then once it clicks, it's really easy. Mental point of origin, man. Have your own personal worldview. Have your own per- personal ethical, moral boundaries. Don't take them from other people. Because that's the problem with uh, Christian morality is that it's not biblical morality. It's the morality of the Christian subgroup that's doing it. Evangelicals have a completely different set of morality than Anglicans and Catholics and Orthodox and Hebrews and Islam. They all got their own different ones, but they all swear they're the right run. They're the, re- they're the true one. It's kind of like French. The uh, the Quebecois always bitch about how the French think they're so good and like a lot of them are insecure and they try to have Parisian accents. A lot of the African French colonies try to pretend like they have Parisian accents and it's just so weird. Like, you know that African accent? Picture that, but trying to pretend to be fr- Parisian. But then there's the there's the, the Quebecois, the Quebecois, right? They sound like quacking and they're like, ours is actually t- more true to like the original frontier French. So it's like true to more old French. It'd be like a bunch of Anglo- English people t- speaking in Shakespearean old English saying, our English is better than yours, sir. Which would just be fucking weird, but whatever. And that's the point is that everybody has this like idealized thing. Nobody can agree on it. And everybody's talking about how they're more pure than the other one. It's like, Jesus Christ. And every one of those you follow isn't helpful. It's just consistent. Like the Christian moral worldview, depending on who you talk to, Absolutely wonderful. You know, turn the other cheek. What would Jesus do? Treat your neighbor well. There's a bunch of mental models built into parables that you can use to guide yourself on your life. Some of them, absolutely useful. Hold up to the test of time. Some of them, not so much. So what do you do then? You're just going to a la carte it? It's like, yeah, you're going to a la carte it. Well, how do I know which ones to pick? Who's going to tell me? It's like, nobody's going to tell you. Didn't I just tell you that certification thing is ridiculous? Don't let somebody else be the authority telling you how to live your life because I will tell you this 100% of the time. If you want an authority telling you what to do. They will always, whether they know it or not, whether they want to or they not, or they don't, 
whether they intend to or they didn't intend to, will always tell you what's best for their life, not what's best for yours. 100%. Women will tell you, women when they're 28, like, yeah, you need to be a good father and have a good job and want to stay at home wife. That's what a good man is. At 20, it's like, dude, you need to get me drunk and hand me coke. It's funny how the same girl tells you two different things depending on the time of day. It almost makes sense now with their stupid astrology shit. It's like, yeah, well, once you're Sagittarius, you want to have a good father with a good job. But as an Aries, you need that nose candy. <laughs> Sam Whiskey, $1.99 Super Chat. That shirt is louder than my neighbor's wife. Marginally louder. Sorry about that. I'll get her, I'll get her to be quiet next time. I'll shove a rag in her mouth. Hey! I love the sweater. I was using Pink Panthers of PFE. Dude, I love this sweater. It's my... F it's like, I hate sweaters because they're too goddamn hot. But I love this one. I found it on some like random thing. There was only one and I'm like, I hope it fits. It's like just a touch too small. And I was like, ah, if I ever thin out, it'll be fine. But if I bulk up, I'm going to stretch the shit out of the shoulders and the chest. But whatever, we're here now. <laughs> the new Menta model just dropped. WWRN. What would Ryan, Rollo, and Royce do? <laughs> But even that, my morality and my ethical framework is not yours. It's going to be different. We're going to disagree on stuff. Me, hardline. I don't like doxing. I don't care if it's somebody I like or it's somebody I don't like. I don't. For some of you guys, you might decide that's not a big deal or not something worth talking about. I like the idea of working hard and not being a bag of shit. Somebody like Rich, for example, is like, no, as long as it makes money, that's all that matters. Completely different you know, rule sets because I'm trying something different. He's trying something different. You got to figure out what's works for you. And the way to tell the difference is not to hand it off to an authority. It's to experience things in your own life and take the things which improve your life in the ways that matter to you. And again, this is the antithesis of an authority handing your things. It's not the government will hand me paychecks. It's not my church will tell me what to do. It's not my wife wears the pants. It's none of that shit. It's me. I have nothing but my balls and my word and I don't break them for nobody kind of stuff. And yes, that's a Scarface line and I used it unironically. Deal with it. Like, what do you want? If you're 20, just got out of high school, you're going to college, you probably want to fuck a lot. You probably want to get laid. At least I hope you do. So what do you do? Do the things that get you laid. Well, what gets you laid? I don't know. Being the fun guy at parties, being interesting, being jacked, looking good. Being around a lot of women all the time. Having other women want you. Having a lot of women find out, dude, you were dating him too? There's a Facebook group. The Have You Been Dating My Husband Too one. I found out about it. It's the funniest shit ever. It's a private group. They don't let you in unless you're a chick. And it's all just chicks like, hey, this guy in New Jersey or whatever. It's like, yeah, I remember him. I was sleeping with him last week. You too? Son of a bitch. A lot of black women too. They're bitching about Tyrone over there. <laughs> whatever. But it's, yeah. And everybody's like, oh, that's bad. I don't want a girl to find out I'm sleeping with a bunch of other girls. Like, yeah, you do. But if you're 35, your career is pretty established. You're like, ah, dude, I, I love going out and drinking and, you know, bringing drugs to the party and having fun with these girls. But it's I'm getting old for this. Like, I'm gaining weight. I'm just, so I have to stop drinking. I have to stop this. I want to go have a family now. Or I want to go just, I just want to have like a, a girl at home we can chill with. Yeah, your strategy is and your moral framework is going to change. You're going to say no to drugs. You're going to probably not drink you're going to be bigger onto fitness you're going to approach women more at the gym shit like that so it all changes so it's all based on what do you want and that's that's the question most guys are afraid of they're terrified of that's why they want somebody to tell them what to do because they're worried about getting it wrong and i'm flat out going to tell you man whatever you want to do you're going to get it wrong you will how do i know this because everybody does you will think i want this more than anything and when, I, when i was 14 I wanted to be a video game tester. That was like, I know I've made it in life. I was like, we want to be an astronaut. I want to be president. What do you want to be? I want to test the newest video game. <laughs> and I was like, heartfelt. That's my thing. And then I saw a documentary on video game testers where they like live at the office and they're like 18 hours. Like, I don't even know what the game is anymore. <laughs> I'm just testing code. I was like, I don't want this anymore. Now I want to be an artist. Now I want to be in the military. Now I want to be a corporate asset. Now I want to be a writer. Now I want to sit here in a pink sweater yelling at people online. And I've achieved every single goal. And once I get there, I'm either happy and enjoy it. Or I'm bored of it and move on. Or I'm not happy because it's not what I wanted. I do something else. So yeah, whatever you decide you want, you're going to get it wrong. And that's okay. Because the skills you learn to get there. The stuff I learned as like a graphic designer extremely helpful later on in the military when I was doing briefs and setting up lesson plans and stuff that those little skills kind of helped out when I joined the corporate world oh it was so much easier to do 
a lot of the work just by the fact that I knew how to do some basic design work. My thumbnails, it's all based on design principles, but book cover, the desktop publishing, all of that stuff. The military time, the waking up at six in the morning, like that, this podcast is at nine in the morning on a fucking Saturday. It doesn't matter if I got drunk on Friday. It doesn't matter if I went to bed at eight o'clock on Friday and watched the, watched the Bible. It doesn't matter what I did. Six o'clock in the morning on Saturday, I'm up prepping for this show because the military taught me that. You know how hard it is? You're in a foreign port. You got a duty watch tomorrow. You have to be on ship at seven or no, six, the 620. It, the, the, the turnover doesn't start till 630. But if you're not visible at 620, people are calling the MPs to come get you. You're, and there's always the story of the guy. He's drunk. I've been drunk. You're at somebody's house. You don't know who it is. You're with a girl. You don't know your phone is dead. So you can't even look for directions. You're probably out of money. And you're like, I have to somehow find out where I am. It's like a, it's like geolocation, but with, with blood stakes. I have to find out where I am. I have to find out what time it is, but you know what time it is. You could be hammered out of your mind. And you, for some reason, like I couldn't sleep in. You just woke up like the Manchurian candidate at 550. The girl's like, what the hell? And you start panicking. Where am I? What am I doing? You kind of, okay, so where's the ocean? All right, walk that direction. And then sure enough, how many times you've been that guy or been the guy watching it? Nothing is more fun than being on the brow. If I had to take somebody's brow, did you watch? Because that was usually comms watch. But you're sitting on the brow and it's like, all right, 620. And then you look way off in the distance. You see some fucking asshole out there with looking like a piece of shit with the walk of shame, just jogging over to the jetty. And you're like, oh yeah, he's got 10 minutes. Think he's going to make it? Huffing it not even hung over yet still drunk and sure enough like 629 he just like crumbs across the brow salutes the ensign you're like you made it just in time or he's like three minutes late and you're like just get in there hurry up if anybody asks i'll just say hey you went to the bathroom first yeah that comes in super handy super handy in fact when i show up to these podcasts like a few minutes late i have to take like an like a, a deliberate effort to not want to be 10 minutes late to everything. It's like, it's my little way of rebelling against my, my brainwashing. So it sucks for you guys. You're like, Oh, couch is on black standard times. No couch is mad at the military and he's still fighting back. Didn't want to do that anymore. Went to corporate. That stuff came in super handy too. Fuck. I still got my suits. I could probably put those on on here. If I ever do like a, whatever podcast and decide to debase myself for social media followers, I'll probably do what every red pill guy does. Put on your nicest suit, which by the way, Nobody seems to know how. I think Justin Waller is the only guy I've seen who puts on a suit that looks like he kind of knows what he's doing. Because he's got a lot of like window panes and, and very like interesting stuff like that. It's fitted well. I find the two big tells when a guy doesn't know how to wear a suit is A, he gets the expensive name brand ones, but they always have some kind of gimmick to it that makes it look weird. Like, why do you have those like tuxedo lapels? You know, the ones, I can't remember what it's called right now, but it's the one that doesn't have any wings to it whatsoever. Or the ones that got like an extra high point on them. You're like, what the fuck? That's going to be so out of date in like a year. And it already is out of date. Or they'll get like, they'll, their first suit will be like an Oxford blue. And you're like, bro, first suit's always supposed to be charcoal. Charcoal, then gray, then navy blue. And then you expand out from there. But if your first suit is going to be like a khaki or an Oxford blue or like a pool table green, it's like, bro. And they're always like fitted improperly. If a guy really doesn't know what he's doing, he still has the tag on the, on the wrist. Just so you know what the brand name is. It's like, you're supposed to cut that off, man. Or they get the buttons all done up. Like you're doing up the top button, the middle button and the bottom button. You're like, bro, sometimes always never. How do you not know these rules? The pants are too long. They're not tapered. Well, you see all these guys on there sitting there talking like they're rich. They got a, I got a Rolex watch. It's like, dude, Rolex is like the, the IBM of watches. Everybody knows what a Rolex is. Rolex is for cheap people who want to look expensive. At least Omega has like, I have like a soft spot for it. Not because, well, the bond thing, but I just like it. But they're the same way. You have to get to like, uh, these fancy watch names that nobody's ever heard of. in order if you want to start like really signaling it. Not even like the Jacques Cartier. They're just trying to sell you status because the guys are insecure and they go hard off into it. Yeah, they never get the buttons right. Exactly. You only get 10 pounds with a good suit. Oh, you mean like up or down before you have to get it hemmed in? Yeah, pretty much. But I, I just like Omega because I've always liked Omega. The James Bond thing kind of got me into it. And then when I was in Dubai, I picked up one. Um, picked up one again when I went to the Middle East the next time. And then my buddy got me one out of there. 
I think I got a, a Rado, and I've got two or three Omega Seamasters, but one of them got the got broken on me, so I was pretty pissed about that one. But I still have it. I'm, but they're so heavy now, I don't wear watches anymore, so they're just sitting in a box somewhere. I bought a cheap, gaudy, oversized gold watch and got nice watch, lost all faith in watches. Yeah. Well, most of the things that are good about watches is, like, there's the technical craft in it, but it's no different than people who buy any other luxury trinkets. Like, there's this French company that makes $60,000 paperweights out of glass. But if you didn't know the industry and you didn't know what made it good, you don't give a shit. You're like, nice paperweight. But most of us, like, I, everything's on a tablet. I don't need a paperweight. <laughs> That's kind of where we're at now. But they always wear these symbols because, do you know who falls for it? Uh, poor people. Poor, economically aspirational, insecure people. It's like spinners on the rims of your car. Do you know who buys spinners on your rim? Do you think Elon Musk has spinners on his fucking Tesla truck or whatever? No. Poor people that want to look rich have spinners. They're chrome. They spin. And you're like, damn, this guy must be wealthy. Anybody who's got like a real car is like, what the fuck are you doing? Carbon fiber attachments on your car. You know who has that? Poor people with expensive cars. You know what expensive people have? Just the car. I don't, why would I put a carbon fiber thing in this? Unless you're like a gearhead and you like doing that and you want the weight or you want to actually race. But if anybody's just driving around, it's like, yeah, this car's worth what, a hundred thousand, but it's just, I don't know. I've always owned the Mercedes. It's just what I like. I like being an asshole on the road. I have a BMW. I'm, I'm Sikh. So why wouldn't I? Yeah, the same shit iPhone owners do to us that own Samsung. That's the manipulative part of it, by the way. That's the, um, and I talk about it in Dread, the luxury branding. There's the fear of missing out. There's the idea of purchase status, signaling. What, what does this say about you when you have this certain trinket? When I'm wearing this suit on the whatever podcast, what does it say about me? And the people selling the suits are like, oh yeah, it tells people that you're expensive, that you have good taste, that you're higher class, that you're above all this rabble. So you look more authoritative. Meanwhile, you're like, dude, everybody's here in like hoodies. There's a chick in the back with autism wearing a Kaiser helmet. Like you show up in a suit, it's completely out of, out of, out of taste for it. I would dress like this for that. The Pink Panther sweater. Sitting there talking about autism. And it's like, women shouldn't be sluts. Like, shut up. You can't tell me about your whole, I'm a Christian conservative. Is that sex doll Christian conservative too? Well, that's different. Of course it is. Because now it makes you look bad. <laughs> Uh, nonstop Dre 360 $2 super chat. The Ryan pill is too cool for James Bond and Chuck Norris. <laughs> Dre, don't look. Clary's filled your head with nonsense with that whole, oh, he's just an asshole. That's his thing. And you feel like you have to perform. You don't have to perform. You can just be a normal guy here, man. Thank you for the super chat. That's my way of saying cut it with the Chuck Norris jokes, you fucker. <laughs> Um, further, the printed version is sold by author Ryan Stone, who does not exist. I've also seen a Ryan Stone in the book sold again, $50 cheaper by Salovin. Just so you know, what the hell is a Salovin? Let me see what you're talking about, sir. It's an antiseptic cream. I would enjoy Ryan and whatever. He would just be charming. Yeah, that's the thing too. Like you got to understand there's subtext to it. And, and and I know we're getting to like, what's your own personal morality? And that's where you just learn these things. Like I've learned if you, if you work hard and you focus on the surface level of what's required of you, learn this from the military. <laughs> I got passed over for every promotion. Well, you're too valuable where you are. You don't ever make a mistake. I'm like, oh, sounds like I just did. Meanwhile, the friend of mine who, who like modded my boss's Xbox to have Xbox Media Center on it, he got promoted. He was an alcoholic who showed up to work late and they're like, he needs to learn responsibility. We're going to promote him ahead of you. Another guy, he ended up got, got caught later on with like um, videos of underage people in his rack. That was a pretty impressive deployment <laughs> snafu. He got promoted ahead of me. The feminist that didn't even know her job got promoted ahead of me. It turns out the only guy who didn't get promoted was the guy who was like deserving of the promotion. Same thing here, man. You go onto those things, like, what's the subtext of this? It's like, whatever podcast, fresh and fit, pearly shit. People just want to watch ugly people yell at each other, or attractive people, or thoughty people, or whatever. I want a demographic, a specific demographic to get mad at another demographic because it feels really good. It's like you watch Jerry Springer. What is that? I want to see some redneck whose life is arbitrarily shittier than mine 
yelling at some other redneck whose life is even worse than theirs so I can feel better about my shitty life. I want to see somebody yelling at Pearl. Call her a centaur. Call her a horse face. Call her ugly. She actually ugged herself up. She's like, dude, if I look plainer and uglier, I guarantee they're going to feel better about yelling at me. Somebody showed her like, I guess they found her on Bumble or something. Like, actually, she looks pretty good on here. Yeah, it turns out a little bit of makeup will do great. Makeup and 10 pounds solves the world. So yeah, you get on these things and they're sitting here having a serious argument. It's like, you're missing the point. The point on this is they're trying to make everybody look like a fucking clown. And they're supposed to be the relatable everyman. Like, I don't know what the guy's name on the thing is. He's supposed to be like you. He's just like me. He does fantasy football on the weekends and he loves Jesus, even though he doesn't really subscribe to anything, but he likes the idea of it. And he's sitting here calling all of these people stupid, just like me. Wow. Meanwhile, you get on there dressed like a clown because why wouldn't I dress like a clown? This is a whole thing as a clown. I'm dressed for the occasion. You guys want to sit here and yell at each other like clowns? Well, you can yell at the Pink Panther. Act charming. It's the erudite thing too. So many people got mad at me for that. The erudite interview. Dude, she was... There were so many times where you had her and she was talking shit and nonsense, had no idea what she was doing. She was contradictory. Why didn't you hammer her on that? I'm like, well, first off, you understood. I trust the audience to be smart enough to know when somebody's talking bullshit. I'll maybe draw a little bit of attention to it, but I'm not going to sit here bicker at them because then they're just going to clam up and treat everything as argumentative. Give them enough rope, let them hang himself with. Secondly, that's not my goal. My goal is not to teach that bitch a lesson. That's a stupid thing to do on these online debates, which I fucking hate. The idea there is her audience is looking at her yelling at this red pill guy for being an idiot. And there, and my audience is looking at me to yell at that bitch and teach her a lesson. It's like, how about this? I'm going to go over here and I'm going to show you how you can be red pilled or whatever. And still a normal, charming, affable guy. This is how you can disagree with somebody without looking like a retard. And if a third party would ever look at this, they'd be like, who's that crazy bitch talking to that guy in the weird sweater? He seems nice. He seems funny. Like you see that a bunch now. I was joking around about how uh, as soon as I get the Minecraft videos to take off, I'm leaving this shit behind. That's my I'm leaving the Manosphere tweet. And there's this girl I follow. She lives in Montana now. She does like uh, venture capital tech stuff. She's living Stardew Valley out the home game. She goes, yeah, I don't care about any of this culture war shit. I just I just like your sense of humor. I'm like, perfect. And that's kind of what I want to, you guys to take away from it. It doesn't matter what the venue is. You could be sitting here arguing about Christianity. You can sit here arguing about thoughtery. You can sit here having a psych student talk about nonsense and bullshit charts. But you can come out of it looking good. You can come out of it being interesting, charming, affable. You can still have disagreements. You can still call somebody on their bullshit, but you don't have to be an invalid about it. You don't have to be a child. You don't have to have these... Uh... And this is the one thing about that kind of reminds me it's like a bunch of grown-up toddlers is that toddlers have no impulse control. When they're mad, they just start yelling and screaming. It's no, there's no filter for it. And that's, again... Men raised like broken women. When they are hangry, they start yelling. It's like, dude, guys have been hungry. You mean to tell me a guy can get hungry and not freak out? Why is that? Because you just realize I'm, hang I'm hungry, I'm angry, and I'm just not going to start yelling. She goes, how do you do that? Well, the trick is when you open your mouth, you just don't push a lot of air through your larynx. It just kind of works itself out. Wow. It's a superpower. Yeah, it is a superpower. Not being hangry. Nonstop Dre 360 $2 Super Chat. When are you getting a furniture sponsorship couch? Dude, if I could get West Elm furniture to sponsor me, I will lean in hard on that West Elm Caleb shit. I'm, I'm looking for it. I wish I could have been Justin Waller's wingman when he was on whatever. I'd make Leela cry. But that's the point. Do you know, look at the optics of this. You go there and you got this soccer mom shitting on everybody about this, that, and the other thing and yelling. What are you going to do? You're going to make her cry? How do you think that looks? Ask Jack Murphy. How does it make you look when you make this traditional conservative women cry on TV? Doesn't look good. It's a shitty one. Yeah, but she's stupid. Yeah, there's all these reasons why you're why you why you should be able to do it. And it's it's perfect because you don't like liars and you're what you're doing is you're ascribing your moral framework to everybody else's moral framework. Read the fucking room. Everybody defends women over men. Everybody, especially red pill men. It's the boogeyman. You got a hostile audience, you got a hostile cast, you got a hostile guest, you got a hostile set of viewers, and you're going to sit here like, dude, I make that bitch cry and then everybody will love me. It's like, no, everybody will think you're a fucking asshole and not in a good way. So you know what you do there? You can disagree with her. You can be dismissive of it. And I think Justin did all right with that. I think my favorite line of that one, and I haven't watched the whole thing. I've only watched like a minute of it. Whereas where she's sitting there, meh, 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 
And he just kind of looks over. And this is like the most relatable thing I have ever seen out of Justin. It's like the most red pill thing. I fucking loved it. Where he just kind of looks over. It's like he's talking to like a, like there's nobody here, but it's kind of like he's talking to himself. It's like, dude, I got to stop coming on these fucking podcasts. This is ridiculous. I'm out. I'm fucking out. This is the last one. And then he kind of gets back into it. And I love that little aside where he's like, just to let you know, I know this is stupid. I don't want to have to justify my life to this wench. And I'm just tired of her shit. But he did it in such a charming way. I'm like, fuck, that was brilliant. Brilliant. If I ever get into the situation, I am going to pull the Justin Waller. That's why I've got his face. Whenever I have like a resignation meme I want to do, there's always the face of Justin being like, just fuck. (laughs) I think it's great. But he understands it. It's a game. It's a social thing. You have to, and Ironwood, again, he talks about that a lot in his blog, uh, Red Pill Room, about the co-ed dynamics. And yeah, that's great to know about positive male identity, male social groups, female social groups. There's a whole other dynamic when it comes to co-ed social groups. And if you want to get good at game, you better be good at navigating them. As much as we, as much as we shit on like the AJ Cortezes, that really simp for women online and shit like that, they're at least playing the game. Like, I don't know if they're playing it on purpose, but being affable to uh, half the population, it's not a bad thing. Remember that whole girls like a man who just gets it? Yeah, well, just get it. Like, is he really being a simp? No, he's not being a simp. I mean, you don't have to be a simp, but there's a way to be affable men and women co-ed without being simpish. In fact, simpish is the kind of way a guy with autism tries to be socially calibrated. You can still uphold your boundaries. You can still not put up with any shit, but you don't have to be a jerk about it. And you can be a jerk if you want to, but you don't have to. I'd argue less is more. It's like this little trick we learn. We call it military theater. When you first teach a class and everybody we're drilling this into your head as you're an instructor, like when your first day of class comes, sit there and wait for somebody to screw up in your class. I don't care how stupid or how small it is. You take them outside the room, just outside it. Like you can still hear, but they can't see it. And you fucking dress them up and you dress them down. You fucking yell at them. Go back to class, teach like normal, never yell again. You have to do that because if you don't, your students will run roughshod over you. And sure enough, my one buddy's like, I'm not doing that. His his students run manageable. Mine, I did that right at the start. He yelled at this guy. He fucking hated me for months until I tell him, I was like, don't worry about it. It's just a fucking theater thing. It's just so you guys don't start treating me like a bitch. And he had a good laugh and I bought him a beer and it was great. But yeah, you do that. And sure enough, they don't fuck with you. It was at the point where they, I remember this. I've told this story once or twice, but there was a, a PT test they had to take. Uh, it was like 10 in the morning. And class usually starts at 8 or 9 in the morning, something like that. So I'm like, look, your guys' PT test starts at like 10. I can't bring you here for 8 and then teach you for an hour and then have you go over there. So what I'm, I'm making a call right now. Just don't come in. Go to your test. Come back. And I go to the senior member of the class. If anything goes wrong or somebody's off topic or there's anything that I need to know, let me know before I get word back from my boss. That's all I ask. So they went and party the night before they got drunk. They got up late and they went to the thing. And then I guess the one chick, she was a Halifax girl, which, you know, when she was drinking, she started lipping off the PT staff. And all of a sudden my boss comes in and is like, where the fuck are your people? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And this is, oh, as a boss, this is the worst thing ever. If I hear, like if somebody under my uh, command fucks up and I hear it from my boss before I hear it from them, because now you have no idea what's going on. You can't. You know, it's being handled. I've got this because you're generally clueless. It's like, yeah, so you tell me first. Anyways, fucking rip my ass open. That was brutal. And then they got back. I'm like, go sit in the class. And wait. And so I went and talked with the boss. I'm like, all right, find out what happened. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Do you want me to charge them? What do you, what's your, what do you, what do you want me to do? He's like, I want you to deal with this. I want it to go away. I don't want to have to charge or deal with all that extra paperwork, but I don't want to see this shit again. I'm like, all right, done. Left it up to me to figure it out. I walked in there five minutes, just didn't say a word, just sat there. And they're like, and they're all, they all, they were already sitting there for like 45 minutes feeling bad. They're like, he's going to come in. He's going to yell at all of us. And they wanted me to yell at them because it made them feel better. Right? Like, oh, it's like absolution. You've been forgiven. You got three Hail Marys and being yelled at and called a heartfelt castle. I just walked in. I was very quiet. I'm like, yeah, I'm not even mad, guys. I'm just very disappointed, man. Like, I, 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 it was very simple instructions. I don't, and they were telling me at the course party later, like, I have never felt so bad in my entire life. It wasn't, it was that day I wanted you to yell at us because we had fucked up. 
but it was just like I felt like I let down my dad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's how it works. They never fucked up again, though. That was the year that the guy stabbed a cabbie with the box uh, box cutter. Another guy got blackout drunk and started getting into fights and that. Not my class. That was the class of the other guys. But these guys, that was it. The point of this story is mostly just to entertain you guys. But yeah, there is an element to this is like understanding the social dynamics at play, co-ed spaces, uh, a little bit of theatrics. You're having fun with it. And then being more influential and persuasive. Not so much, I want the world to make sense and I want to be right and you're an asshole. And if you cry, I teach you a lesson. Don't yell at me, I'll yell back at you. It's like, relax, relax. There's ways to do this stuff. There's a charming, there's a socially adept way to do these things. And I can't teach it. Nobody can teach it. You can only give examples of it when you do it. And then the other person will listen and watch and mirror it and adapt it to their own sensibilities. And that's what you do about all this stuff. You watch other people's mistakes and don't do them. You watch other people's successes and adapt them as you need it. And then out of that, you kind of describe, and then you take the, what you're actually looking for out of the situation. You want to get laid? You want a family? Are you trying to teach a class? Are you trying to keep, uh, keep you from having to do five or six charge reports, which is like tons of paperwork? Like, what is it you're trying to accomplish? And you take all of this stuff together, and then you take all of the game, you know, and you put it together. And it's awesome. And when it works, it's awesome. When it doesn't work, it's awkward. And it's it's going to not work a lot. Like, there's a lot of times where I stepped on my own dick. Mm-hmm. Ten to one over the amount of times I can tell you a great story like this that I fucking crushed it. And that's fine. That's just the human condition. You're going to screw up a lot. So, Chuck the Painter. Five euro super chat. Heartfelt. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you sir i will not talk about the cuck article funds to buy a matching pink panther pant <laughs> i like that i was thinking my next one should be like uh uh pink cargo shorts with the drawstring at the bottom so they're kind of like half capris i think that would be fun but i think i'm gonna lean in on the uh on the cuban miami outfit with like the white linen pants and the straw hat anyways and then we got jay anth with 100 fuck I can never remember what those ones are I got to look Indian rupees that's the one 100 Indian rupees thank you very much sir I am a guy I yell when I am angry am I a broken woman how do I fix that well I mean I kind of displayed how to fix it but yeah yelling when you're angry isn't so much it does it's too simplistic to code for guy it codes more for child you got to remember, you got to have control of your anger. It's just, and it's not for like, oh, that's just women holding you down. No, it's anger has a purpose. Anger is a social emotion. It's probably one of the only social emotions. Anger requires a pain and it requires a grievance. If you don't believe me, nobody yells when they're by themselves. If you stub your toe, you're hurt, but you're not angry. If your wife drops a hammer on your foot because she's mad at you, now you're angry. Anger requires somebody to do something. And the whole point of it as a social emotion is you're articulating to another person that if you don't cut this shit out or change what you're doing, I'm going to get violent and that's it. Now that's a powerful tool. A lot of people are scared of male violence. A lot of people, which is why we have a ton of laws and social taboos and uh, behaviors we have around managing and neutering male violence. Women are allowed to manipulate the shit out of guys. They can run roughshod over their life. They can ruin them. They can cause them to get suicide. It's all legal. But a guy getting angry and punching the drywall is assault, brother. So yeah, when you're angry, first thing you're supposed to, and this is like, for, how do you fix that? Identify why you're angry. Where's the pain? Where's the grievance? Most of the time you'll find it's, uh, it's either unrealistic expectations or it's legitimate and there's nobody can answer the question which one it is but you because most people say all anger is legitimate no it's pretty legitimate your wife leaves and takes the kids yeah you're pretty pissed why she took my family and she left where's the pain well i don't have my fucking children anymore there's the pain all right does yelling solve this one no it doesn't does uh punching your wife solve it no it doesn't it actually has negative consequences so as a guy, you have to think, okay, where am I going to use this anger properly? And this is kind of where the working out comes into take it out on the gym. Well, that's not going to solve anything. Well, first it's going to cut into the ability for you to react emotionally to it. You're going to react emotionally to the gym and I'll see you grunting and screaming, yelling at the weights. And that's fine. So now that you got clearer head, you had to take to think, all right, how do I get my kids back from my bitch ex-wife? And then you take more deliberate action. And ideally that's where you go with this. 
Again, anger, absolutely valid as a human emotion. It's useful for you because it lets you know when there's triggers that you, and environmental situations you need to deal with, but you're never trained on it. This is why when you get like the single mom shit, you'll always end up with, uh, and black America is a great example of this. They're like 10 years ahead of the curve, but you always end up with, uh, men that are raised around women will either become simps or thugs, simps or thugs, because those are the most extreme archetypes of, of men. Women are, are divine and we need to worship them. That male provider instinct, but ramped up to 11 because that's a symbol of masculinity. How well you protect women. Great. Go hard, hard on that. You go autistic, full autistic. Yes. I'm going to be the best protector of women ever. Simps. And the other one is like, well, real men are conquerors and they take what they want. Thugs. I'm going to get a gun and shoot anybody who fucks with me. I'm going to yell at everybody. It's because they have no guys guiding them on like how to, like I was just talking about there, how to deal with your anger. Nobody, there's no male figure telling them how to deal with that shit. There's no man out there saying, yeah, you're angry, you're pissed off, but there's nothing you can do about this one. So you have to let it go. There's nobody saying, yeah, but be smart about it. And so they learn these like extreme archetype versions of it. And that's why men are being raised as effective women. They have no guidance, no training, no man one-on-one course. And how do you get that? Well, a dad, an older brother, a good friend, a friend's family, a male teacher, a male principal, a male boss, military. There's tons of examples of where you could learn it. And slowly but surely, men are being weeded out of all of them. So it sucks. And you may be 25, 26, 27 years old. You don't know how to do this stuff. That's just fine. We got enough assholes online right now kind of exemplifying better ways to act. But that's the problem is that you don't know. What is a good way to act? Like, should I act like that guy on the whatever podcast? Or should I act like the guy on Ryan's podcast? I mean, obviously it's the, the me, not them. But if you're just some clueless fucking kid, you don't know that. I don't know, man, but this one's fucking funny. Maybe this is the way to ask. What color is your Bugatti? Sounds good to me. Is it? I don't get it. I've told 18 girls about my Bugatti. Not one of them has fucked me. But this one guy in the pink sweater here started acting charming and told me how to be a nice, lovable asshole. It seemed to work. I don't know. And that's what you have to do now. You just have to learn through experience. And Carl talked about this. I'm going to end the podcast here in a minute. But Carl, the old Black Label Logics on the cast, he talked about how a lot of guys were ugly ducklings in our generation. They didn't get laid in high school. They didn't get laid in college sometimes. And it was like, and he was like that. And I was like that, you know, late, late bloomers. But then all these naturals were getting laid tons in there because when they were 13, some older woman took advantage of them or they got attractive at 15 and they're learning this stuff early. So that's great, but they didn't learn it. They learned it like horribly because they had no self-awareness. It was just like trial and error and they happened to get lucky. So it takes them maybe 10 years to hit their stride and be like fully on top tier dude, right? But you learn it late. You're like seven years in and you're just learning it now. The beauty of it is you're an adult. You're smarter. You can learn quicker. So you make up that 10 years in like three or two or you know what I mean? That's the point. So that's the one advantage you have is... Even if you learn this stuff late, you're able to learn it faster because you're more deliberate because the idea is you're more mature physically, emotionally, the opportunity is more mature. Like, dude, if you're 35 and only now just learned to stop simping for women, you're at like, you got a 10 year period of peak sexual market value to draw on. So once you start working out, you instantly start looking better. Once you start being charming, you instantly start being more charming. It's like that girl, uh, you know, those like rom-coms in the nineties and two thousands, where it's always like the nerdy girl and she's just dressed in like coveralls and has glasses on. And then like her gay best friend is like, I think we can make you pretty. Takes off her glasses, makes her put on a dress and all of a sudden she's stunning. It's like that, but for guys. Is that men being raised as defective women? No, it's an allegory <laughs> or a metaphor or something. I don't know. So yeah. So yeah, go watch She's All That and then think about that. What's your version of glasses and what's your version of those shitty paint covered coveralls? That is why competence is also being lost. No self-discipline. Yeah. Uh, I think that a product's only child's and a few siblings. Nothing can get money off. Okay, I'm fucking lost on the conversation. Sorry, guys. You're on a conversation. I'm out. Uh, Sam Whiskey, $1.99. Girl with a Kaiser helmet and pancakes is a keeper. I don't know much about her. She looks cute. Does she Does she talk a lot of shit? Is she just like the the Ed McMahon of that, of that uh, show? Like, yes, sir. Is she the Andy Richter? What's the deal? I don't even know. All right, so we're going to end it off. Let's make fun of Walsh and Tate. Fuck them. Princess Diaries sure sounds good.
I usually post pictures of my kids online, but they're infants and you can barely see them, so you know it's it's fine. But a YouTuber named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone tweeted showing off the F trophies for clout. So the babies are trophies that I'm showing off. It's perhaps not a surprise that a picture of a proud father would be so upsetting to the sort of man who clearly never had one. I've argued with Ali and I've argued with Jack on this. They're saying it's because I don't have kids. That wording, the the sight of a man who uh, with proud photos of his kids would make no sense to a man who never had one. It sounds like a man who never had a father, but they're reading it as a man who never had kids. I'm positive. The way he's saying it is for a man. A man wouldn't know what a proud father is because he never had one. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, Glenn's hosting it. We're going we're gonna to redirect afterwards, so it's all good. So let me know in the chat. Is he saying I don't have kids or is he saying I don't have a dad? Because I'm pretty sure, 99.9% .9 sure, I've written three books. I should know how to read English by now. That he's saying I don't have a father, which is crazy because I had two. <laughs> no dad, no kids. I guess this is like the, the, the red pilled equivalent of that. Is that dress blue or white? All right. Ian, what do... No, Ryan Stone. I see he's the most important guy in the world. Ryan Stone. Give a fuck about Ryan Stone. Me and him have gone back and forth. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a fuck with Ryan Stone. You hear that? I'm the most important guy in the world. All right. Cheers, boys. Seventy nine T twenty four fifty eight learning corp little red riding hood take one. <laughs> 